you are listening to the Mito podcast and I am Ashley and I'm Megan and today our guest is coming to you directly from San Diego uh, we're talking to Dr. Richard Haas and he's the director of the neurometabolic clinic at Radies Children's Hospital director of mitochondrial disease laboratory and a professor at UC San Diego School of Medicine Dr. Haas's clinical interests include neurometabolic disease, general child neurology, Rett syndrome, neuromuscular disease, and neonatal neurology. In 1994, he established what is now the Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease Center and Laboratory at UC San Diego as a facility dedicated to the research and clinical evaluation of mitochondrial disorders. His attempt to merge research and patient care has been a hallmark of his career and has created a referral basis for both domestic and international patients. Hi, Dr. Haas, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you both so much for asking me to uh, participate in this. This is a great honor. Thank you for joining us. So I guess we should just go ahead and, and dive in. What inspired you to become a mito doctor? Well, um, I'd always been interested in uh, biochemistry and did uh, research. Um, uh, and in my early training years, I did a year of biochemistry at uh, Cambridge University. Um, so um, when I encountered uh, uh, what seemed to be a, a, a metabolic biochemical disease in the uh, latter years of my training, which was actually at the time at the Hammersmith Hospital in, in London. Um, I was looking after a little boy named uh, David, who was uh, four years old with uh, Lee's disease or Lee's syndrome, which as you probably know, I, I'm sure is one of the more severe forms of mitochondrial disease. So at the time, this was like uh, about 1977, we uh, really didn't know very much about these diseases. We uh, uh, didn't have any ideas about how to treat them and uh, <clears throat> there hadn't been all that many patients described. So I realized that this was an area that needed um, a lot of uh, effort and where hopefully we'd be able to help the patients. And uh, so I remained interested in that. And then when I came across to the States in uh, uh, Denver, while doing child neurology, I was also in uh, a uh, biochemical laboratory focusing on mitochondrial disease with my mentor at the time, Dr. David Stumpf. So uh, did about uh, two years of uh, two to three years of basic uh, uh, biochemical mitochondrial research with that group. Um, and then I came to San Diego. And we're so glad you did. <laughs> oh, fine. Uh, well, what do you suggest that um, families do when they first hear about getting a mito diagnosis? Well, I think there's a lot of... Um, anxiety obviously associated with that diagnosis and um, what you tend to see on the internet is the really bad uh, forms of disease which fortunately not everybody has um, and so um, I think you really need to try to seek some advice from um, a, a team that is familiar with mitochondrial disease and we have um, Actually, now in the mitochondrial care network, there are 22 um, centers that uh, are interested in mitochondrial disease. And I would say that there are about uh, 10 that are very active in this space and they're dotted around the country. So obviously we are one in San Diego. Um, but I, I think that um, it's not always possible to get a referral to one of these centers, but if you can, it, it might go quite a long way to, to uh, helping with understanding the disease and what can be done and what should be done in terms of diagnosis. So um, 
you know, these days we're always after a molecular diagnosis. In other words, we want to know what the gene defect is that's causing the disease because then we can uh, look at other patients with the same gene defect. We have a, an idea, a better idea as to how things are going to progress in the child who's in front of us, child or adult actually. And uh, uh, some ideas about treatment may come from that information. But the other thing that's really important is that all of the clinical trials that are um, have been underway and are uh, about to start up are requiring a molecular diagnosis uh, because they want to be sure that the patients have uh, mitochondrial disease, genetic mitochondrial disease, because there are quite a few mimics out there. I should say one, one other thing that you can do straight away is um, get in touch with uh, the patient advocacy groups. So um, uh, the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation is the largest one, that's umdf.org, and MitoAction is another one. And uh, there, there are uh, some other smaller groups that, that are available, but I would start with UMDF because that's uh, really uh, trying hard to educate people and provide support and resources. And um, they actually do send quite a few patients our way as well. I, I, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, I have to say that I'm on their scientific advisory board and um, I uh, have been working with that group for 20 years now. And I think it's important just in our podcast, and we've talked to so many different families that some families are lucky enough to get in contact very quickly with a doctor that's familiar with Mito while others have such a long journey um, trying to get a diagnosis and um, eventually getting to say a doctor that specializes in mitochondrial disease. But um, Ashley and I are both ambassadors for the UMDF. And one of the amazing things they do is they do um, connect families with doctors. So that's very important that um, any parent can go to the UMDF and they will try to connect them with a doctor close in their area or as close as they can get. And as you know, um, you know, patients often go through a long odyssey before they actually get to a diagnosis. They, on average, are seeing eight different doctors and, and it can go on for a good number of years for some people before they actually uh, find out what really is the problem. And so um, I, I think, again, um, going straight to a, a group that will connect you with someone who's working in the area is a good, good move. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would like to also point out that for UMDF, it, I think a lot of people might get intimidated because they think it's this, this giant foundation, which it is growing, but they have more of a small family feel. So when you do reach out, um, they work really hard on trying to help you the best that they can. Um, so if you are in the beginning stages of your mito diagnosis, please do reach out to them. Um, and at least it'll give you a step in a direction that they might be able to help you down a path to um, discovering more of what you need for you or for your child. Um, I know you, you touched on it a little bit <clears throat> with uh, talking about the gene that is affected. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the genetics of mito? Yes, of course. So uh, it varies a bit depending on how old the patient is. So um, starting with adults, and you know, about half of the patients I see are adults with mitochondrial disease. It's a pretty common problem. Um, starting with adults, uh, probably about 60%, so the majority have a mitochondrial DNA problem. Um, and the the thing about uh, mitochondria is that they're uh, little structures inside the cells. And of course, as uh, everybody on this podcast knows, they make energy, but they do an awful lot of other things as well. And uh, to make a mitochondrion uh, takes uh, about uh, 1,200, 1,200 proteins. So they're very complicated. 
And uh, within the mitochondrion, you have mitochondrial DNA, which codes for some very important uh, activities, uh, but a very small uh, percentage of the overall mitochondrial um, uh, proteins. So <clears throat> mitochondrial DNA um, codes for some things called tRNAs, which help the mitochondria make proteins <clears throat> from amino acids. And um, there are 22 of those, and they're one particular hotspot for disease. <clears throat> and then it encodes for um, a number of electron transport chain uh, components. So the electron transport chain is the part of the mitochondria the, that makes the ATP um, from ADP, makes the energy. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA encodes uh, uh, six of uh, 42 subunits in complex one. So one of the most common mitochondrial diseases that we see in children uh, is complex one deficiency. And um, again, mitochondrial DNA only encodes six of those components and all the rest are nuclear encoded. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, it it, it uh, doesn't encode any of complex two, and it includes it encodes one um, uh, a protein component in complex uh, three, which is cytochrome B, and then three in complex four, um, and uh, <clears throat> two in ATPase, which is complex five. So. Um, if you add that up, that's uh, 12 components, I think, if I can add properly, are, are encoded by mitochondrial DNA and all the rest, uh, probably a hundred different um, uh, proteins are encoded by the nucleus. So <clears throat> that other 40% of adult patients have um, a nuclear encoded disease and there's a wide variety of those things and we're learning about more of them um, every day, really. Um, and in the pediatric population, um, about 80% of children with mitochondrial disease have nuclear encoded um, disease and 20% uh, have mitochondrial DNA. So what's important uh, about that is that the uh, inheritance of these two different pathways, the nuclear gene, uh, components or the mitochondrial DNA components is often different. So everybody um, says that mitochondrial disease is encoded um, <clears throat> uh, from the maternal line, comes from the maternal side of the family, but that actually is only true for um, the um, mitochondrial DNA uh, what are called point mutations. So the majority of mitochondrial disease is not maternally inherited. It, um, it, it usually has a, a contribution from the uh, father and the mother, and it's what's called a recessive um, disease. Um, and uh, that's really important for people to know in terms of family planning. And there's another reason why it's very important to know what the, the defect is, uh, the gene defect, because we can uh, really tell you a lot about whether there's any likelihood of other family members being affected. Very complicated, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, we've actually talked quite a bit about it, so hopefully <laughs> in our previous podcast. You talked to Sophia, who I'm sure told you the same stuff just more. Yes. <laughs> it's always fascinating, though. Every time we talk to someone new, my mind still gets blown. Like, there's, there's just a little bit of information that I didn't know the last time, and mm -hmm. it just makes me sit and think just how crazy and intricate mitochondria is. Um, yeah. not just yeah. excuse me, mm -hmm. Fido in general, but, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So when, um, a child does get this diagnosis or is, um, thought to have Mito, what are some of the supplements and why do you prescribe supplements for mitochondrial disease? 
Right. And, uh, you know, not, not every doctor who deals with uh, uh, metabolic diseases is um, as aggressive about supplement use as, um, as we are. Um, and I, I have to say that the, what's called the evidence base, um, so the kind of proof that uh, individual supplements are helpful is, uh, is pretty sparse because um, these supplements generally are uh, vitamins and uh, over-the-counter kinds of uh, uh, supplements. And uh, no one has really had the opportunity to do a proper clinical trial uh, treating patients with supplement with, with a particular supplement and then uh, having another group of patients who are not treated to really prove that it's effective. But having said that, uh, the majority of us working in this field do uh, use uh, cofactors quite a great uh, And I uh, don't know what that was. <laughs> that was me, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's all right. And um, the rationale for each of them is that they're involved in, the, um, in either protection against oxidative injury which is uh, something that happens when the electron transport chain is uh, kind of working overtime, spinning off free radicals. So some of the supplements are, are protective against that, um, but pretty well all of them are also um, uh, what are called cofactors for these enzymatic reactions. So the uh, hope is that if you increase the amount of the cofactor, you may um, uh, help the reaction to work better. And so that's kind of the basis of it. The, <clears throat> I think the, the most important one from my perspective is um, coenzyme Q10 or the better absorbed form is called ubiquinol, uh, which you can get um, uh, in lots of different places. It's, it's probably good to have the, the best uh, uh, form available, and, and that's uh, uh, either available online from the manufacturer, which is Epic for Health, or uh, Costco has uh, the, the same uh, uh, ubiquinol, but uh, made by the same company, uh, which is actually a Japanese company, although I think they're making all of the ubiquinol um, that's used in the U.S. in their Dallas uh, plant. Um, so um, ubiquinol or coenzyme Q10 is actually part of that electron transport chain. It accepts electrons from complex one and complex two and passes them on to complex three. Um, so it's really the only part of the electron transport chain that you can give people and uh, it also is um, an antioxidant. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the other piece of information is that when we look at muscle biopsies of um, uh, patients who have problems with the electron transport chain, um, quite often they have low levels of coenzyme Q10 in the muscle. So uh, putting all those things together, we um, uh, push coenzyme Q10. And I, I, I um, want to let people know that you shouldn't expect when you start these supplements that there's going to be a dramatic improvement. Sometimes there is, but that's pretty rare. I really view these more as a defense against uh, things getting more rapidly worse. And I think that that can be quite helpful. Um, so the other kinds of um, supplements, ubiquinol, and then um, high dose B vitamins um, are uh, uh, often used, certainly by me. Um, and maybe the most important one there is vitamin B2, which is riboflavin, because these electron transport complexes are what are called flavoproteins. In other words, they have riboflavin bound to them. It's an important cofactor. Um, another one that we're increasingly using is, um, is alpha lipoic acid, which is uh, an antioxidant, but also a cofactor for um, 
for a, a different part of the mitochondrial uh, system called pyruvate dehydrogenase and uh, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So there's some rationale behind, <coughs> supporting uh, everything that we're doing there. But the evidence that it really is helpful is, is uh, fairly slim, except in some, you know, conditions where it should be uh, much more convincing that the, these cofactors can be helpful. So one would be um, coenzyme Q synthesis problems. So the body makes coenzyme Q10. And if you have a gene defect in the pathway that makes coenzyme Q10, then uh, you are likely to benefit uh, by high dose ubiquinol or CoQ10 treatment. Um, so there are some um, disorders, uh, and again, you you find these out really by finding the genes that are causing the disease. There are some disorders where um, the evidence is much stronger that the cofactor treatments are helpful. So obviously, I could go on forever about this, but I don't think I should. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... <laughs> I think what you had mentioned where you said not for maybe people or families to expect a huge change in maybe their child or themselves once taking the cofactors. And you said sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't. And Ashley and I are probably good examples of that because Troy has just fortunately been pretty healthy the whole time. And he's been on um, the supplements since he was probably about two. And we haven't, we didn't really see any great progression, um, but you know he's he's uh, been pretty stable. Whereas Angie had a different reaction. Yeah, she was immediate. Um, she after just one dose, we saw a major change in her. And as a, as we carried on with doing um, all of her supplements, it just got better and better. Um, she everything was up. From, from that point when we were able to finally administer them to her after her G-tube. Um, so we have both sides of the spectrum. We have one of, I saw it immediate, and Megan who has, it, it, it's taken a while or maybe you don't see something right away. Um, so regardless of, of speaking more to our, our listeners, um, these are just supplements and they're vitamins. So there isn't as much of a, um, Sorry, you can hear my cat now. We we warned <laughs> Dr. Haas earlier that um, the animals would uh, come come and visit. <laughs> um, but they are just supplements. So if you can talk to a doctor or if you want to look into those, um, we do suggest it because everybody will react differently. It might help, it might not, but um, it's definitely something that Coming from a mom, it was, I, I think everyone should try it if you can. But I think the important thing, again, is to get advice because there are unfortunately a lot of other things out there that are uh, maybe actually dangerous, but uh, people are not aware that they are. And uh, so talking it over with someone familiar with mitochondrial disease is a good plan. Yes, so and especially with finding out what types of dosage or, or what you should be using, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we live in a very strange time right now, <laughs> the pandemic. Um, so one of the things I know that um, I've been very concerned about with Troy and trying to keep him safe and healthy um, is just, uh, you know, mitochondrial disease and possibly um, what you should do if, you um, actually catch COVID or um, just kind of a doctor's view on what you should do if you're a mitochondrial disease patient um, in, in today's world. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, everybody, as you well know, should be wearing masks when they're um, in um, any environment with people who are not parts of the members of the immediate family. And uh, uh, the very best kinds of masks are N95 masks or KN95 masks. And I think that uh, family members of mitochondrial disease uh, uh, patients 
should be trying to wear those kinds of uh, really good masks uh, to protect themselves because um, the, the ordinary face uh, masks and the cloth masks that uh, you know, people are mostly using help to protect other people, uh, but they really don't protect you from catching the virus. Uh, whereas the N95 masks um, filter out 95% of the particles, and that makes a big, uh, uh, big difference. So that's what we use in the hospitals. And fortunately, you can get at least KN95 masks over the internet pretty easily. Um, so uh, that's what I would suggest you use because that protects you the most and uh, that's going to protect your child or other family member with um, with mitochondrial disease the most. And of course, it's not just mitochondrial disease, but um, uh, cardiac disease, um, a high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, kidney disease, all of these kinds of patients are more susceptible to having a bad time with a COVID infection. Um, so uh, as far as I, I am not aware of any of our patients who have actually um, contracted COVID. Um, for the children, uh, the good news, as you um, know, is that they tend to have an easier time with, uh, with COVID infection. Um, but uh, we do think that uh, uh, mitochondrial patients are likely to be at increased, uh, increased risk if they catch it. <clears throat> I uh, actually have one um, uh, young adult patient who uh, has uh, uh, a pretty severe mitochondrial disease and her mother um, <clears throat> was uh, COVID positive and had a, a a fairly mild uh, course, and the patient, um, at least at the last time I talked to them, had managed to avoid catching the disease from her mother, which is was uh, pretty lucky, really. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, a, a researcher at the National Institutes of Health called Peter McGuire, um, uh, who is really interested in immunity in mitochondrial diseases. And uh, he's doing a survey um, on COVID disease. And we're also doing that, uh, doing surveys in some of the other uh, uh, research areas. So the uh, um, uh, North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium, where we're doing surveys there. And uh, uh, there are other parts of the NIH that are doing surveys in fragile patient populations. So the uh, Rare Disease Consortium, uh, which uh, includes mitochondrial diseases, is doing a survey. So uh, they're trying to find out what they can about what happens to patients when they uh, uh, develop COVID. But so far, that hasn't been a big problem, I think, because everybody's so scared about it that they're really not out and about. Uh, if they have a, 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 a child or if they happen to be an adult with mitochondrial disease. Mm -hmm. So that's the good news. I, I, I want to say one other thing, which is that um, people are really scared to come to hospitals uh, because they perceive that that's where, you know, most of the COVID patients are. And it is true that they're going to be in intensive care settings, but they're in very isolated parts of the hospital. So um, for instance, at Rady Children's Hospital, we have a COVID ward, which is usually empty, and I can't even get in there. And everybody who does visit the hospital um, has to be screened, and the patients when they're admitted are screened. Um, and in the outpatient uh, clinic, setting. Um, we're still doing most of the visits by telemedicine, but um, yesterday, or at least on Wednesday, for instance, I saw three patients in person. And 
The outpatient clinics are um, being very cautious about social distancing and masks, and we all wear sh face shields and gloves, and uh, it's really a pretty safe environment. You'd be very unlucky to catch COVID in hospital. I think it's much more dangerous in other locations. So I'm uh, giving all of that um, um, you know, encouragement to um, tell people that if their child is sick, they should not delay going to a hospital because that's uh, still a very safe place. That's good to know. I'm glad we're, the hospitals are taking lots of precautions because that you do, would automatically think that that would be a place that you would see more COVID patients or possibly run into um, COVID. So that's good to know. Uh, I think also just in general, even before COVID times, that was the number one scare. You never wanted to bring your mito child to a hospital for fear of anything that they could catch. So I think as bad as COVID is, it's also good that something like this, in a sense, has happened because it shows the precautions. It shows that hospitals are um, up to date with everything that they need to do and they're taking all the precautions that they need to so that it doesn't spread. Um, we're, we're even testing patients uh, before they have EEGs, for instance. They have to have a COVID test three days before. No. Um, so uh, we are pretty cautious and so far have had very, very few uh, pediatric patients at least. That's awesome. That's really good to hear. Um, what, is there any research that you would like to talk about that's current or that you might be working on? Well, um, I think that the hope for, uh, you know, this group of uh, metabolic diseases, mitochondrial diseases, is going to be clinical trials. Um, and uh, we, we've been involved in um, several of them so far, which have not really proven that there is an effective treatment yet. But it's a... A real area of interest, fortunately, for um, drug companies and biotech companies. And uh, we currently have three clinical trials that um, are going to be starting up. Um, and I'm doing those at um, uh, UCSD in uh, the what's called the Altman Clinical Translational Research Institute. So um, we have the special clinical trial area called the CTRI, which is really um, state of the art. It's only about two years old. And uh, it's uh, uh, probably uh, maybe the best facility in the country, actually. So it's, uh, it has its own uh, investigational pharmacy inside the unit. We have uh, labs for um, uh, handling samples um, before they're sent out and, and of course refrigerators and everything and a whole load of rooms including uh, four overnight rooms that are not at all crowded. They are very, um, uh, large uh, spaces and uh, they're taking all sorts of precautions there um, in terms of uh, patients that are seen in the CTRI. So there's a one-way system and of course everybody has to wear masks and uh, uh, they've got it down pretty well. And uh, these trials are going to be starting, um, I, I think the earliest is possibly going to be October. Um, we have one trial um, that uh, is focusing on, on uh, children with mitochondrial disease and um, seizures that cannot be controlled. Um, and, and that's with a, a, a drug that was in trial in the past um, for actually this really nasty disease, Lee's disease. Um, and it, did, uh, it, it failed in terms of proving that it was really um, sufficiently effective. But the company noticed that it did seem to be helping the seizures in those patients. And now uh, they've come back to uh, do this trial. And uh, we think actually that that treatment, which is kind of a super coenzyme Q10, is uh, 
it is helpful for some patients with mitochondrial disease just generally. So we're looking forward to that. And then there are two companies uh, doing a very similar kind of treatment, um, <clears throat> which is um, a treatment called a PPAR delta agonist, um, which um, is basically um, a small molecule that activates pathways that make mitochondria divide and uh, produce more mitochondria. So um, uh, one of those was developed here in San Diego at the Salk Institute. And um, uh, these are, um, uh, I think, very promising. Uh, it's a very promising treatment. Um, they are f for um, uh, both, one of them is for children and adults, the other is just for adults, but the primary what's called outcome measure is a walking test called the six minute walk test in the case of one and a 12 minute walk test in the case of the other. So um, they're really going to be focusing on uh, mitochondrial disease that's affecting um, uh, walking and, and uh, exercise intolerance, and that generally means muscle disease. But again, to get into these trials, our patients have to have um, a, a genetic diagnosis. Um, and um, uh, so we, we really focus on trying to get that done. There, there are two uh, ways of looking for gene defects. One is um, to look for mitochondrial DNA gene defects. And we have um, a um, test which we're generally doing now um, to kind of exclude a problem with mitochondrial DNA. And that is a buccal swab where we take um, a swab and collect some cells from the inside of the mouth, just rubbing it against the cheeks. Um, and the DNA is extracted from that. Uh, that's much better than a blood test for mitochondrial DNA. And um, th that kind of is the standard test that I'm using in the clinic setting uh, for people that haven't been tested for mitochondrial DNA. If they happen to have had a muscle biopsy, muscle is better. But we're doing less and less of those muscle biopsies. It's fairly infrequent now. And then uh, for nuclear gene testing, um, a blood sample is fine. And uh, you really need samples from uh, father and mother, or at least a couple of close relatives um, to interpret that testing properly because uh, uh, the, the testing is looking at thousands of different uh, genes. And, to, and, and we all have a lot of changes in genes and to try to figure out um, whether these changes are the cause of disease, you really need information from other family mem members as well. So uh, that's called an exome test. And uh, that's what we try to do in our patients with uh, uh, mitochondrial disease uh, that uh, DNA, mitochondrial DNA has been negative in. And uh, so that uh, is often done in children. And um, <clears throat> it's the, the, the downside is that the insurance companies don't like paying for this testing, either one, even though the mitochondrial DNA test is, is about um, $1,200, the nuclear gene testing is about $7,000. So it's often a fight, as I think you both know, too. <laughs> we do. <laughs> have, this, um, have this done, but it can be very helpful in terms of tying down the problem. Although, again, we have many, many patients where it hasn't given us the answer um, because there's still a lot that we don't know. Even if we're convinced it's a genetic disease, we don't know all of the genes that uh, work in the mitochondria. Um, so uh, it's, it, it's an important thing to do, but it's not a guarantee that you'll get to the answer. And then there's one other level, which they specialize in at uh, the Genomics Institute at Rady Children's Hospital, 
which is called whole genome sequencing. And um, that's looking um, even uh, further into our DNA, um, past the 20,000 or so genes that we know about, looking at the whole DNA content. And um, that uh, requires um, <clears throat> a lot more uh, analysis um, and uh, often provides answers that uh, we don't really know the significance of. Um, but they've um, uh, been able to uh, do this test very quickly, the whole genome um, sequencing uh, in 48 hours if they need to. And we're doing that routinely in um, sick babies in the neonatal unit and in sick children in the pediatric intensive care units to um, really cover everything we can to try to find out what the problem is. So that uh, over time is going to become probably the standard um, test because it gives a lot more information, but it's even more expensive than the exome. So that it's going to be a little bit down the line, I think. That's great, though, that we you are that it work towards to be able to make that a standard, though, because mm -hmm. I feel like um, there's a lot of people that don't get their diagnosis, or they are on this road for so long, um, just because their child is sick and they they don't go through genetic testing because they don't they don't know to they don't know what's happening. So it would be amazing if this was standard because then you'd be able to catch things so much sooner. You'd be able to help so many more families of just understanding what life is going to be like. Yeah. So eventually it will be. Um, and I, I would predict, you know, in maybe 10 or 20 years that you, you may even as part of the newborn screening program have whole genome sequencing. Um, but um, you know, some people think that's really intrusive and they, they don't want to know, for instance, if they're uh, likely to develop a disease later in life. And that's quite understandable. It's understandable if the disease isn't treatable, but if it's treatable, that's not really a good position to take. So on those consent forms, again, you both noticed that um, there are... Um, about 60 different um, uh, genetic diseases, for instance, cancer causing diseases like the BRCA genes mm -hmm. that are screened for when you have this testing done and uh, patients have the option of saying, yes, I want to know the results or no, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, and I think- It's quite complicated and probably again, Sophia, talk to you about that. Yes, and obviously Troy had some more recent genetic testing done, and I did think that was interesting that there was the question on there whether or not you would want to know or you wouldn't. I never thought about that because, of course, I wanted to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, that is interesting that there's that option. Yeah. And I, I can understand people thinking it's evasive. I Like pre-Mito, I probably would have second thought that and think maybe, I mean, I would want to know if there was diseases, but you think about getting a genetic test and not going through a mito journey, you, you do think it's kind of evasive, but now being on the opposite side of that spectrum and having mito, um, I a thousand percent want to know, and I will definitely encourage people to do the same because it is better to be prepared. It's better to understand what you're, what is going to be happening. Um, That's right. I mean, um, you know, people wonder why we do all of this testing, because as you know, there's lots of blood and urine tests that we do in trying to tie down whether you really do have a problem. And um, I tell them that really, until you know everything you can about a disease, you, you don't have all of the information to be able to treat it, um, if indeed there is a treatment available. But you have to understand what you're dealing with, really. And so that's why we do that. Yeah, it's, it's very important. And for anyone that is listening right now, um, if you are starting your mito journey or if you are confused or not sure if you want to do genetic testing, um, personally, I, I encourage you to 
because like we were saying earlier, if there are trials that are going on, you won't be accepted unless you have this. So whatever you decide to do with the information afterwards, I, I do think it's important part of the journey to understand where, where everything is. And also just to be able to find other families that are like you um, to understand their story and what they've gone through and, and be able to prepare and know, know what's happening for your future and, and the present. Um, but Dr. Haas, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about or anything you wanted to um, tell our listeners? Well, um, you know, we really didn't get into the COVID situation all that much. Um, and um, we're, our little group is um, doing a Zoom call with the UMDF in uh, September, talking about how we're coping with COVID. So that might be something that people would want to uh, uh, listen in on. Is that one of the Mito doc calls? Yes. Yes. Okay. We can put that up on our website for listeners to mm -hmm. get the link to that. We don't know what we're going to say yet, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually listened to the first one that they did right when COVID started and it was, it was, it was definitely beneficial to have tuned into that. So now it's probably, since we know at least a little bit more, um, it's probably very beneficial for families if they are concerned. Yeah. Good. And, and we appreciate what you do with taking care of our children as well, obviously. You um, were Angie's doctor and you were Troy's doctor, and we appreciate all the care that you give our children with Mida. We feel very fortunate to have you in our lives. You are both very sweet, and thank you. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us, and thank you everybody for listening. You were just tuned in to the Mido podcast. If you have any questions, or if you have any topics that you would like us to cover, please email us at mitopodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, and you can use all three of those options to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. So until next time, we hope that you all are having a safe and healthy day. <laughs>